welcome everybody and uh, thanks for inviting us here for this talk. So this talk will be about, about a, a technique for bug finding and this technique is called bounding model checking and we will also present our tool which implement, implements this technique and our tool is called LLBMC which stands for low level bounding model checker. Okay, let's start with a very general problem. The battle against software bugs. Uh, so, I want to give some examples about how software bugs turned out in realistic examples and what some people suggested how to deal with those software bugs. So let me start uh, back at the end of 2008. So this example is about mobile devices in the, uh, and more particularly about the Microsoft Media Player Zoom. And a strange thing happened on, 20, on uh, 31st December of 2008, when suddenly all of those 32 gig uh, 30 gigabyte Zoom devices suddenly stopped working. So if they were switched off, you could not start it again. And that was, a, uh, of course, a problem, because many people wanted to use their devices on New Year's Eve to play some music on their party, and the devices didn't work. And the reason for this was that there was a bug in the clock initialization of these devices which didn't work on some particular days due to leap years and the 31st of 2008 was just such a day on which this device or this clock initialization routine didn't work. So fortunately on the next day, 1st, of, 1st January of 2009, this bug didn't show up anymore because the leap year had changed. Uh, and then the device started working again. But nevertheless, it uh, brought some not so good press for Microsoft this program. Okay, let's look at another example, which happened around the same time, and it's also about mobile devices. So this time we're talking about a device from Research in Motion, and this device is the Storm, uh, which was introduced at the end of 2008, and it also suffered from some bugs which many users complained about. And what is perhaps more, even more interesting than those bugs is the reaction of the co-CEO, Jim Bosley, which you see here, uh, and how he reacted and what he said about how to deal with such bugs. He said in an interview that buggy smartphone and software is just a new reality, so, which mainly means you cannot do anything about it. So, yeah because there is so much time pressure and you don't have enough money. You just have to accept that there will be bugs in your software. And perhaps over time, with new releases, those bugs will vanish. But of course, this is not a position that we want to uh, keep. So we want to do something else with bugs, not just say that's uh, something we can't do anything about. OK, so let's leave the area of mobile devices and switch to some other area. And uh, that's about security and uh, about bugs in operating systems, system software and applications, which can be exploited by hackers, for example, over, over the web, or in, uh, other notions in this, uh, in this context, as cyber war, for example, where also such things are uh, exploited. And the example that I want to show here that happened at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, and it was later named Operation Aurora. And uh, it was caused by a zero-day vulnerability in Internet Explorer, which was exploited. So th this was a, a security hole in a Microsoft Internet Explorer. And that was exploited by presumably Chinese hackers uh, to break into computer systems and also into Google systems, uh, into uh, systems from Google. And they tried to uh, get access, illegal or unauthorized access to intellectual property from Google. They also hacked some Gmail accounts from Chinese human rights activists. Uh, and the reaction of Google was afterwards that they, they said that it, is a, that it was a highly sophisticated and coordinated attack what was going on here. But what, what is the main point here for me uh, is that it was, this was finally just caused by a very small error in Internet Explorer. There was one use after free error here which started this whole thing. So this very small error in, in one program and caused a, a very large effect. And besides Google, also other companies were affected. So in total, it was said that 35 companies from all different kinds of industry sectors were 
affected by this uh, attack here. Okay, so this is uh, such another example of such an error, perhaps a small error, which has a uh, large influence. And this is, this is not a, a very special case, so this is something which, uh, which is quite general. So, uh, and you can see this here from this figure, for, uh, for example, here. So this figure shows the number of vulnerabilities which were caused by buffer overflows. So buffer overflow is just one particular kind of, of uh, software errors which can be in a program. And you see it, those, and this, this here, what's shown here is the number of software errors or, uh, or <coughs> vulnerabilities in software which, for which an exploit was known and uh, which were caused by buffer overflow errors. And you see the numbers are quite high, so you have, uh, and they are quite stable. So you see that uh, in 2008 you had more than 500 such vulnerabilities caused by buffer overflow problems, and this number is not really going down very fast. So it seems that the situation and how we can deal with such bugs or that, uh, is not getting much better over time. languages. <laughs> Okay, so and one thing which I found quite interesting uh, was an, a message uh, which was posted on an internet forum that's on the LWN Linux forum and uh, it was posted by some user in 2005 in reaction to a buffer overflow error uh, in the Zlib compression library. And uh, here is what he has, he has written, this user Joe Buck was his alias that he was using in this forum and he said we should have been done with CVBugs long ago because it's, this is old software, it's 10 or 15 years old. And he continued, it should be possible to analyze the code and prove that there are no remaining buffer overflows. And that's exactly the direction that we also want to, to follow. So not like uh, what you have seen before uh, with RIM, for example, just say this is a new reality, but we uh, want to do something about this along these lines here. And uh, what's also interesting is that he continued to bad summers over. <laughs> it would have been nice to ask Google to sponsor something like that. So perhaps we will have the chance in the future. Okay, so this closes uh, my list of examples on just uh, more or less random selection of some uh, problems in software and the effects that it can cause. Okay, so we now have these defects in our software. The question is how, how do we deal with them? And uh, how perhaps should we deal with them. So let's compare uh, the reality, how bugs are currently handled and what is our vision, how they perhaps could be handled in the future. So I think you have uh, written a, a software, a nice software which consists of different modules like this one here, but unfortunately, hard to avoid, this software still has some bugs. So you see them here, they're, they're still there in the software at some places. And so what to do about those bugs now? So Typically, you will start to write some test cases and run those test cases on the, on the software and just see what happens. So this means in some way you have your, your armory or your machinery to deal with bugs and you just start looking at some very particular points and shoot your errors at uh, those points and see what happens. And in this example, it's perhaps a bit hard to see, but there was no bug at this place. So you just think, okay, my software is correct uh, for this particular example, so let's continue with some other test cases, some other errors that I shoot at this software. And in some cases you might be lucky, like here with these arrows, here you hit a bug, but with others you are, you are not so lucky. But, and finally, of course, you do not know whether there are still bugs left in your software. Of course, you might reduce the number by writing good tests, but there might still be something left. I don't know who it was, but there was this quote that testing can only show the presence of bugs, but never the yeah. absence. Yeah, it's from Dijkstra, if I remember correctly. Uh, this is the, the same uh, direction. Yeah, and so, of course, what we would like much more is if there would be some kind of device or oracle or thing which could tell us exactly where the bugs are, or which uh, places we have to look at, or which test cases do we have to write to find our bugs. Or you can also think of it like some kind of scanner. The scanner would just go over your software once, like perhaps a scanner at the airport, like this here, and then afterwards, suddenly it shows you where your errors in your software are. And then you can just uh, fix these pinpoint, pinpointed errors in the program. 
And this is uh, how we think of our tool, that it works in some way like this scanner that we have just seen. Okay, so let's now turn to this method that we propose as a as this <coughs> scanner. And this um, method is called bounding model checking. One, yes? one question first. So how, how do you define bug in that context? I mean, bug is a very broad term. And in general, yeah, yeah. it's surely undecidable, or you would need spec for the program to decide what is a bug. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah of, of course, as, as you say, there are very different notions. So we mainly think of, let's say, uh, obvious programming errors, like these buffer overflows, which you've seen before. And buffer overflows is, for example, something which you can detect without writing any <coughs> specification. Mm -hmm. Or integer overflows would be another such class, or division by zero. So I, I'll show some examples. So certain cases where you run into undefined behavior in some form. Yes, undefined behavior or behavior which makes your program crash or just you know, many illegal things that happen with your program. So this, this is very much like, or it's on, on, this, on the source code level of course, so it's not a high level uh, error finding in a design for example, or to improve designs, but it's on a very low level, uh, very low level, so that's also why we have chosen this very low level uh, bound model checker for our tool. But we will see a bit more about this kind of bugs. Okay, but let's turn now to the technique that we want to use, this technique of bounding model checking. Now we'll start with a few important ideas of this technique. So perhaps the most important idea is that with this technique we want to analyze all paths of a program and all inputs of a program at the same time. So typically with, with a test case you're just going through one program path, you're just using one particular uh, set of input values for each variable, one exactly uh, one exact value, and then you run it through. And here we want to do everything at once, so we check we want to check all paths and all the inputs at once. And then there is a, strict, a restriction, as you see here. So not all arbitrary paths, but only paths up to a fixed length is what we can check with our tool. And of course, you might ask, well, what does it mean? This fixed length and fixed length in our case means that the the number of loop iterations is limited, which can be taken in each loop, and also the number of nested function calls which can be taken are limited in this approach. So this is something which you give to the program or to the checker before you start it. So you would say, analyze all loops up to 1000 loop iterations, for example, or analyze function calls up to a nesting depth of 100 or something. And then all paths which are which fall within this limit will be analyzed, but not the ones which are outside this limit. And why are we doing this? Uh, the problem is that checking properties of programs in general is undecidable, but if you have finite paths, then this means that everything else also gets finite. So if, if you have only finite program paths, this means that during these finite runs, only a finite part of your memory and of your variables can be can be looked at. So all the data structures will also be finite in that case. And uh, checking properties about finite things is something which is decidable then. Okay, so this, this is the first idea. Analyze all paths at once with this restriction of having the limit. Can you say something about the practical limits? What depth do you do? Yeah, so uh, for, for loops it's, it's uh, very dependent on the program. So uh, typical things which we have uh, seen during our test were perhaps 100 or 1000 iterations of a loop which, which we were using. Um, but of course it depends on many things. So if you just have, for example, one very large buffer with hundreds of thousands of bytes and you have one loop which goes over it to initialize yeah. it to zero, then yeah. you need uh, a much larger bound. But uh, typically you can also parameterize this or just choose this smaller buffer for verification. And, but around 100,000 uh, would be such a number. And nesting depth? Nesting depth is, uh, in our, our, my experience, it often uh, is sufficient to use very low numbers of depth, nesting depth. So two is often sufficient, three, four can be used. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Typically you do not need very yeah, high. You're, you're talking about C programs here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I haven't mentioned this. Uh, <laughs> That will be perhaps on, the, on some of the next slides. Yeah, so it's mainly C what we are looking at a uh, little bit. We also started recently to look at C. <coughs> okay, and mainly system software or low level software. 
Okay, the second main idea is to encode the whole program in a logic, in a suitable logic, so because that's uh, where provers can work on. Uh, and what's, what's perhaps important in our case is that we want to transform our program in some kind of stateless program. So typically your program has a state which evolves over time. Let's say you have some uh, structure or a class which stores some values and you're just changing those values over time. And we try to reformulate this program into something which is stateless. So this is a bit like in functional programming, uh, something that is like, for example, you're having arrays in functional programming. But uh, this makes it much easier to uh, transform it to, to logic. And the te techniques that we are using here is, for example, uh, this um, SSA form, single static assignment form uh, for variables, which yeah, by our technique is also already given. Uh, then we are using excessive functions for memory and also these techniques like uh, or other techniques like loop unrolling, what we are, what we are using, and uh, function inlining helps to get such a state. Okay, so the, the next main idea is uh, to model the semantic of these instructions very precisely. So this means we do not want to have an approximation of what an exact instruction does be, but we want to have exactly the semantics of each instruction in our program. Uh, and we achieve that by modeling everything on a bit level. So, uh, for example, if you have a bit operation in your program, like a bitwise OR or AND or some shifting going on, uh, then this, all this is modeled on a bit level, so you, you get exactly which bit in your variables will be set to one uh, zero. And this mainly means that uh, by this logical encoding, we're simulating the hardware which runs on your system, which also finally works on the bit level or on, on, the, on the gate level. Uh, and that's simulated. So, you're going to a very low level also in verification, and which might seem, might seem a bit strange because the formulas also get very large by this, but uh, the solvers that are currently available, they are able to handle this. So how, how do you define the, the memory models? So like in modern hardware, you usually have weak length memory models, which are underspecified, really. Mm -hmm. So how do you, what, what do you do about that? You just assume some deterministic behavior, or? Mm, no, so we, we have some, oh, we, just as you can have uh, indeterministic behavior, uh, for example, for your program inputs, you can also have indeterministic behavior of, about your memory. Okay. <laughs> so for example, you can make, uh, yeah, so we, we have one particular memory model that we have built into our system, but it, uh, for example, doesn't say anything where the memory blocks, which you get from malloc, for example, where they are exactly located, but it just specifies some non-overlapping constraints uh, for different memory, block, memory blocks that you get from allocation and things like that. So it's constraint defined, I would say. Can, can you deal with uh, caching behavior? Um, things like that? So, you know, if you have synchronization yeah. primitives, the synchronization mm -hmm. primitive is implemented wrong. Could, 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 could you pay? Yeah. That's, that's not something that we are concentrating on. Now. So we are just looking at sequential programs mainly, mm -hmm. uh, and not in parallel programs, mm -hmm. and because of that we are also not looking at synchronization sure. things, for example. Okay. And, uh, so caching is also something that yeah. we are not looking at. So memory model yeah. is more like allocation model. Yeah, allocation model is perhaps a good yeah. Okay, so now if you have this uh, logical formula which comes out of the trans transformation of your program, you can then use uh, these solvers which are already there, set solvers for example for propositional logic yeah. formulas or SMT solver for decidable bit stronger logics which can also talk for example about arrays or about bit vectors or something like that. And we are using these solvers also. Perhaps just shortly two <coughs> historical notes. So this technique of boundary model checking is very established for quite some years now in hardware verification. Uh, so almost all hardware companies or chip building companies are using this technique to verify the chip design on the checking technique. And then uh, around 2004 this technique to verify hardware was trans transferred to the software area and that was done by Clark Kulning and, and Lehrer from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Okay, so this was the general technique, so some ideas uh, uh, some, to get a rough understanding of how this technique works. And now we will turn to our tool, uh, which is the LLMC <coughs> body model checker. So now what you already guessed before is uh, that LLBMC is working on C programs. Also, 
uh, on C++, C++ programs, uh, we only started with that. Uh, and of course it tries to find bugs, uh, remaining bugs in the program. And let's look at some design goals. So one goal was that we wanted with our tool to handle all programming language features. So this means if you have written a C program, uh, with other tools you often have to change some constructs in your program just to run it, run it, to make it run through your verification tool. And that's something which we didn't want to have, so we wanted that whatever you're using your C program, it should run through the tool. So it should just support all language features. So even a bit esoteric ones like perhaps bit fields or things like that, or, uh, or using um, memory-based typecasts if you write an integer to memory and then read the same part of the memory as an array of bytes, for example, such things should also work. Okay, and uh, to make this easier, uh, we are doing our verification not on the source code level, but we are instead using a compiler intermediate language. And in our case, we're using uh, the intermediate language from the LLVM compiler. And the advantages of using such an intermediate language is that it is, it is much simpler than the pro high-level programming language like C or C++. So uh, typically, it just looks like risk assembler, and you don't have to deal with complicated uh, things like perhaps operator overloading or some conversion routines which, which run uh, in the background without uh, being explicitly mentioned in the code. Okay, so we also wanted it to be easy to use for non-experts. So this means that you do not have to write large specifications which might perhaps also be the, even be larger than the program itself, but it should be possible to use it with, without any specifications or with just very few specifications about your program. Another goal is uh, to achieve high precision. And high precision in this case means that we do not want to get false error reports or limit them as far as possible and we do not want that our tool misses any errors. So, but doesn't it by definition if you're only tracking some finite state? Yes, uh, of course, yeah. So you, uh, I think that the general problem is that uh, program bug checking or verification is undecidable so you have to make some restrictions. Right. And I think that perhaps the big art is how to make these restrictions in the best way. So there are, of course, many different uh, possibilities how you can restrict your input to get, uh, or your, your checker to make it uh, decidable, or your problems to make it decidable. And uh, I think that this, this techniques of bounding paths is something, something which makes a lot of sense in practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are using these big precise techniques here uh, to avoid false error reports or missing missed errors. And we want to provide a comprehensive set of built-in checks. So I will show you a bit more about these checks on the next slide. And scalability, of course, is a problem also uh, with these uh, logic-based tools because the problems are, from a theoretical complexity standpoint, quite hard. And so you have to find some tricks to, to make that run also with larger programs. One thing is that we are using these uh, very advanced SMT solvers, for example, and the other thing is that we uh, also try to get rid of easy sub-problems by having some preprocessors or simplification procedures. Okay, so before I come to the built-in checks, uh, I just want to have this other slide here which tells you a little bit about the internal scheme, schematic of our tool. And, uh, so how the chain is of how the input is processed. So on, on the left you start with your source code program, then you run the LLVM compiler front end on that, and what you then get is this uh, inter LLVM intermediate language, this bit code it's called, uh, which is like a risk assembler uh, transformation, but it's still a bit more abstract than the usual binaries that you have for your Okay, so this is LLVM, and now maybe our tool starts here from this point. And what it does first is that it unrolls loops and does function inlining. This is mainly for handling these fin uh, finiteness or limit, limit properties and to get a stateless formula. Then we have this transformed intermediate language, which we then transform to a logic, so we do a logical encoding. And then we have a formula in this particular logic of bit vectors with arrays. We then have some simplifications which run on this formula to make it smaller and to get rid of those trivial checks which might be in there. 
then we pass the simplified format to SMP solver, and finally we get the result. It can either be that it has, hasn't found any errors in the program, or if it has found an error, it will also output an error trace to show you the location of the error. Okay, let's turn to the checks that are built in. So uh, without you having to specify anything, uh, you can use these checks. So the first thing is that it are two checks for integer overflows. For example, if you add two large integers, and the result of this addition would be not representable in the uh, space or in of your integer, then this would be an overflow. Here is another example, which is perhaps a little bit harder to see, uh, that also an overflow happens here. And the, uh, the overflow ha flow happen can happen at this point here, where you have the negation of x. And there is one case uh, where this negation can lead to an overflow uh, for signed integers. And we will show this uh, a bit afterwards in our demo, what, uh, what is for which particular values it happens. So another thing that we check is uh, for divisions by zero, for integer divisions by zero. So something like this here, for example, if you have a statement where x or one variable is divided by another variable, and you wonder whether y can be zero in any case. So in some cases it can be relatively easy to see whether this can happen, but in other cases, perhaps like this one here, it might be not so easy to see whether such a division by zero can happen, and uh, how to check for this. Another thing is invalid bit shifts, which is perhaps not so well known this problem. And uh, this is something uh, which the C standard defines. So if you have a, let's say, a 32 bit integer and you shift it to the left by more than 32 bits, then the result is undefined. So you might expect that uh, it's just filled in by zeros, uh, which is what is shifted out, but that doesn't happen. So it's just undefined, and implementations are also doing something. Uh, different here. So typically it's just um, the shift width is just taking modulo of the width of your operator. So that's something what we check for. Then we check for all kinds of illegal memory accesses. So one uh, thing might, for example, be such an array index out of bounding, bounding but also uh, all kind of other memory accesses. So what we are mainly doing is we check all reads and writes for memory, no matter where they come from, and check whether they fall into, uh, into a legal area to read from or to write to. We're checking for invalid frees. So invalid free would be something where you have a, uh, a pointer which doesn't come out of a previous malloc instruction, but it's just some other pointer which you pass to this free. We're checking for double frees, which is maybe a particular case of invalid frees where you free the same memory twice. And then we have some further more esoteric tests that we've checked, uh, that we've uh, built into our tool, like uh, mempoly uh, tests, for example. Okay, and at this point, I want to pass over to Florian, who will show a little bit uh, about our tool, how it looks like in reality. And, uh, Just wait for the camera to be aligned. Okay, let's get started. Uh, we start with the first example that was um, this small program, and um, what we want to show is what happens when you run this uh, through our tool. And we'll uh, take the file apps.c and the um, uh, function apps, and we want to check if any of these built-in properties are violated here. And you can see it compiles the code to, um, the thing is, uh, compiles the code to this LLVM bitcode file, that's apps of Dot C dot BC, and then it runs that, uh, our tool on that file. And it did indeed find a bug, um, and it gives a short synopsis of what that error is. Um, it tells us what kind of error what it was, signed integer overflow, and it tells us on which um, assembly line it was. And it tells us uh, what the values were in that case, uh, that were in, somehow involved in this particular instruction. So in this case, we divided zero by minus, well, a large number. Subtracted. Uh, subtracted, yes. And um, what you can see here is uh, the precise location in which this error occurs, and in which this, this undefined value uh, was calculated. And you can see that it is the um, red equals minus x case. And what happens here is that this particular value of x uh, that we gave to the method is uh, in min the smallest possible integer, 
And what happened in this case is uh, we tried to get the uh, absolute value of that and that is not representable in uh, 32 bits. So that would be in max plus one because uh, two's complement is, is not symmetric. And that has to cause an overflow somehow. So this is what happens here. What our tool did is it essentially tried to, well, virtually executed this method for all possible values of x. So that's 2 to the power of 32 different uh, possible values. If you try to run that uh, manually and test every one of them, it would take um, minutes, hours, I don't know, quite a long time actually. So um, we're quite a lot faster. We can do that in um, 0 0.007 seconds. Um, these are toy examples. They are, we picked these small examples so they fit onto one screen, but we can do a little bit more than that. Um, the next example. Could, could, the, you, could you change the right to be called minus x plus 1? Um, the code? Just. Um, like this? Yep. Or the minus of yours is just. Yeah. Yeah. Still there. Uh, what you get now is, I assume the numbers change. It's still the same, same one. It's the same, same, yeah, it's the same actually. Yeah. But we have... Um, okay, maybe one minus six. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Zero minus six. Yeah, or okay. yeah. Um, one, minus one minus six. six. It did detect a different number. It now divides or not, uh, subtracts 1 minus x. So, yeah. yeah, but the minimum. Yeah. Um, we can play around with a different example. Well, maybe we do that offline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have the second example here. Uh, this is a simple division, and um, we wrapped it in a function which takes x and y. So x and y can be any value, and you probably guessed that this is also uh, Dougie. And, well, yeah. Yeah, not C. Funny. And you can see that, well, obviously it contains the bug in that division line, and it tells us it was a division by zero in which line assembly line it is and uh, in which uh, line C code it is and what the values are. And you can see that Y is zero, so uh, obviously that's a division by zero. So what we uh, can do to get rid of that is um, we can catch this particular back if one is still in that file to, for comparison and if two is the same one. And because you know the division by zero is not defined in this case, we try to approximate it by int max simply because that's the closest we can get to any kind of uh, result. Obviously, it's a, it's a very poor replacement, but um, better than crashing in that case. So we run the tool again, um, and we get still we get a bug, and this one is not that expected. And the bug this time is to have uh, well, minus a very large number and y is minus 1. And what happens is very close to the case we just had. You divide by minus 1, which is taking you know, um, the symmetric value on the positive side. And that is, again, undefined. So uh, what we do so here is... You can see an overfill error now. Perhaps you can scroll up. Oh, oh yeah, we can yeah, scroll yeah. up and show that it actually detects yeah. this is not a division by 0. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I tell him that y will never be 0? Um, you can add uh, something which is we call an assertion. So yeah. you can write earlier uh, we our assumption is uh, LLBMC assume is uh our uh -huh. favorite and then this also is Yeah well, the way we fixed it here is to fix the method and just to 
you know, yeah. take that case again, and we, int max is, is the closest one we can get to uh, int max plus one. So we take that one, and we, we can verify that one. Um, and this time it tells us there isn't a bug in that code anymore. Um, okay, so what else do we have? Um, Invalid delete is interesting. We try to, because we know you're interested in C++ more than C code, we try to implement a, a little bit of C++ support. And we had about a week for that. And um, we got this um, case again. Can anyone uh, see what happens in that case and why this is, um, well, why this will produce a bug? And if we actually um, um, you can see that it does indeed detect this particular um, missing version of the struct. And what happens is that this cast up here from the right to base to does pointer arithmetics on uh, the pointer O. Um, points into the middle of this derived class and not the beginning of it. If we now call delete on this without a virtual destructor, we call delete and essentially free uh, in C is the replacement for that uh, on this uh, pointer which was never allocated directly, which is in the middle of an allocated block, and that is illegal. Uh, what we do is we don't statically just check that this uh, is missing a virtual destructor, but we actually execute or um, simulate execution of that code, and, and we catch that particular example where this does actually happen. Um, yes, so these are the first examples. Okay, yeah. So thank you very much. I think we have to wait a few seconds. Memory is adjusted again. Yeah, so this was just a small selection of these errors. So we haven't shown you anything, for example, about this memory uh, accesses, new memory accesses. Uh, but perhaps we'll have later on the chance to show you something, or if that, uh, somebody of you wants to see that later, we can also do it after the talk. Okay, so I want to switch now to a, a little bit uh, different thing. And, uh, so the question is now, if, if you have this tool, uh, how can you use it in your, in your daily work? So typically, you will have test cases, and the question is what to do with this tool, or how can you, what are some ideas how you can just your test cases to make such a tool like our own work for testing the final bugs. Okay, so what would be a typical workflow with this LBMC? Of course, the first thing is that you can just check for these low-level errors which are already built in. So you just do more or less nothing, run this tool on your code and see what it outputs. Okay, but this might already find some of those errors, but there might be, let's say, perhaps more interesting things that you also want to check. So for example, some functional correctness properties which are not covered by this lower chest tests. And the question is now how how can you come to such functional correctness tests uh, with this tool that we I will show this here. I've, I've called it migrating from testing to verification or to this uh, systematic way of bug finding. And one possibility is just to uh, to check the functional correctness of a part of your code just to provide an alternative implementation of it. So we Afterwards, we will show an example of this. Uh, and then you just have these two implementations, and you just compare them uh, whether on all possible inputs they produce the same output. And if, if this is the case, then you can be at least a little bit more sure that your program is correct if those two implementations are um, different enough. Another thing uh, is uh, something which was called parameterized unit tests, or also abstract testing, so there are different names for this. And uh, so the name parameterized unit test uh, comes from a uh, uh, Microsoft research paper from 2005, which uh, has to do with their PEX tool for testing software. Uh, and they have used this name, or this notion of parameterized unit test there. And uh, we've uh, done something similar in the automotive software uh, checking. So what is the idea behind these parameterized unit tests? So typically in the unit test you just have one particular case that you check. So one for each variable you fix one value and you run, it, uh, run your code uh, with those values and see what's the outcome. 
and in, with a, such a parameterized test, uh, you would just take one variable or several variables and not fix the value for those variables, but just leave it open. And then you want a tool to check all those variables at once, or all those values for the variables at once. And this could, for example, instead of initializing it to zero, you might know that your program expects perhaps integers between zero and 100, and you would just then uh, give such a range and want to uh, check it for all those values. And a third possibility is uh, to write a checker program. And uh, the idea here is that uh, if you have a quite complicated algorithm to compute something, it might still be relatively easy to check whether this result is correct. And then what you can do is to take, you write, write a verifier or a checker program which checks whether your output is correct, which can be relatively small. You have your original program code which, which computes some solution, and then you put them both together and check them together. And this would mean that you have such a checker function which takes the input to an original problem and the output of what your program does and then uh, you check the, the, your original program together with this, with this checker function and see whether this checker function always says yes, this is a correct output for uh, the respective input. How would you make sure that your checker implementation is correct? Yes, it's, of, of course, it's, uh, I think a general problem uh, if you want to do functional correctness checks, so whether you're using requirements or, or other kinds of uh, specifications about your program, it's, but what was the program that you have to make sure you that have your the in, the, in, the, in the same medium, you're likely to make the same mistakes as in your original implementation, right? So yeah, it, it might make sense to have definitions like on a logical, mm -hmm. um, abstract level, and then the implementation of a lower level language and compare mm -hmm. these two against each other. Yeah, that, that might be another alternative. But what, what I hear, for example, had in mind is if, if you're writing something like such a logical solver like a set solver, for example, then it's very hard to compute such, an, uh, such a solution, but it's quite easy to, to check such a solution. And uh, if you write such a checker program, that might be so trivial that you believe that you can <laughs> narrate this. I see, I see. So that was the idea here. Okay, so now it's time for a demo again, and this time uh, Stefan will give, give the demo and uh, <coughs> show uh, two of those methods uh, to go from testing to Systematic bug finding verification. If you wait a second, yes. Yeah, now. Let me go. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, this is a big example. Essentially, it shows um, what Carsten just mentioned. We have an alternative implementation of a method whose function and correctness we want to verify, and then we compare whether that alternative definition of the function computes the same values as the original ones. In this example, is, uh, essentially it's a population count example, so you want to figure out how many bits are set in a given bit vector, and this bit vector x, for instance. And there are some clever ways to do that, which is this optimized population count function, which essentially just does a few bit shifts, logical uh, or bitwise end operations, and some arithmetic. And of course, you're interested to know whether this actually computes what it's supposed to compute, namely the number of sets bit is an X. Well, one way you can do it is you could, of course, do some unit tests, see whether it works correctly. Uh, but again, there are two to the 32 possible inputs, so unit testing is going to be quite expensive. What you can do instead is you can define an easier version of so the offer function, which also is supposed to compute the population count, but it's so easy that you probably believe that it computes the population count of an input x, which is this reference pop count function. And now the, the way to verify that the optimized function is doing what it's supposed to do is you compute the outputs of both of those functions and you want to check whether they always compute the same return value. And uh, this is done in this main method, in this driver method, so it computes the return value of the optimized implementation, the return value of the reference implementation, then it asserts that those two values are always the same. And our tool, well, is a bug finding tool, so it tries to find a way where this assertion fails, which means an input x where the two implementations have different return values. And if it cannot find a bug in this program, meaning it cannot find an x where they disagree, then we have shown the function correctness of the optimized version. So let's see what our tool is doing on this example. It takes a little bit longer now, but it's still much faster than unit testing. 
because we essentially still has to check all two to the thirty two to the power of thirty two many inputs. It takes slightly more than five seconds. Unit testing again will probably take more like an hour or so. And it finds no disagreement in the implementations, in the reference implementation and the optimized implementation, so we can be quite certain <coughs> that the optimized implementation is actually correct as well. Okay, the next example I'm gonna show is um, the second um, method that Carsten just mentioned, um, where we essentially want to generalize unit tests. So here we have now a function which is supposed to compute the next larger number for a given input x, which is a power of two. So for example, if you give that function the value 5,800, then the return value should be 8,192. So it should always compute the last, the next larger power of two. And it again does some weird bit shifting and, and uh, bitwise operation, so it's not really clear that it, it's working. You could again do unit tests. So for example, you could just pass it that number 5,800 and see what the output is, and then you could assert that it's always computing the right value for that input. But we want to be a little more generic than that, so we don't just want to test it on one input, we want to test it on a whole range of inputs. And this we can do using this um, assume statement in this driver method. So essentially, the assume statement saying x is, should be bigger than 8,992 and smaller than 16,384. And for all values within that range, the method MPO2 should always return 16,384. So it's, it's more general than unit testing in the sense that it covers a, a larger range of inputs, not just one input. So let's see whether the implementation is correct for this generalized test case. And again, it's quite fast, it doesn't find an error, meaning that for all possible inputs in this range, it always computes the right output, which is nice, but of course we could be more general than that even. And this is um, more like this parametric test cases that Carsten mentioned. Now it becomes a little harder to specify what the output should actually be, because now we only assume that x is not negative and not too big, because we don't want an overflow. So it should be less than int max half, essentially. Um, and that's the assumption that we have on x. So we now check for all x that are non-negative and not too big. And um, we want to check whether the function computes of the next larger power of two. And we do that by using three assertions. First of all, we assert that the return value is bigger than the input, that it's not too big, so it's at most twice the input, and it should, of course, also be a power of two, which we can also specify using an assertion. So now we're actually checking two to the 31 different inputs, and we want to see whether the method is correct for all of them. And again, it doesn't really take very long. We don't find a bug, meaning that uh, for all of those inputs, the, method, the function MPO2 always computes the correct output. And I guess that actually concludes um, the second demo as well. And is gonna okay, yeah. continue. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, so you've seen these uh, examples so far from our tool, but uh, those have all been quite small examples just to make you see what the uh, possible checks of these tools are. And I will now show you some first results that we got. So this tool is relatively new, so we haven't made extensive testing, uh, but nevertheless I have two results here which are a bit larger here. So the first example of what we checked was a uh, function uh, blit, or it's, it's a program which is called blit, and that's from a, a embedded system benchmark suite. And this, this suite is called PowerStone because it's also for power consumption testing and that's just a bit larger, it has 96 lines of code but uh, you have to set quite high limits here. Uh, you have to set an unroll limit of 1000 because loops are taken uh, many times uh, and function in a limit of 2 and then it detects uh, an illegal bit shift in this benchmark which uh, presumably wasn't the only for this, that is this an area here. And this means, so this kind of bit shifts are a bit strange uh, things that we try to detect but as I mentioned already uh, if you shift such a value which is a 32-bit value by more than 32 bits to the left then the result is undefined 
So this would be undefined because here what can happen on the right hand side is that this value gets uh, 44, so you would have a, a shift of 44 bits, which is just undefined here. And uh, this took quite some time, mainly because of this unrolling, so that was uh, a bit more than one and a half minutes to uh, find this error here on my computer here on my laptop. And another example where we uh, found an error was uh, in a routine uh, for MPEG-2 video decoding. Uh, that's a decoder which is quite some years old and it was written by the MPEG Software Simulation Group. Uh, and we took a look at some parts of this uh, decoder and in particular the integer discrete cosine transform which is <coughs> a heavy arithmetic uh, to trans transform these uh, blocks uh, of video. And so the whole decoder consists of a bit more than 10,000 lines of C code uh, and this unit test that we wrote, or this parameterized unit test uh, for checking this discrete cosine transform routine that consisted of 766 lines of code including headers. And so what did this routine do? So it took one input, uh, 8 by 8 bytes or 8 by 8 short integer inputs, uh, passed it to this uh, inverse discrete cosine transform and looked whether uh, this routine works correctly. And we were just looking for these low level bugs, these built-in checks that we had there. Uh, it required a loop under a limit of 1024 and a function limit of 2 and we detected an array index out of bound error in this program. So this occurred after having computed by this, uh, heavy arithmetic code some particular value that was used as an index into an array. And this uh, index was just too high for the array. But it was really, uh, not really obvious to find, uh, uh, to, to see from the code directly whether such values could be computed from the uh, uh, discrete code and transform And uh, this error was found in seven minutes uh, on this Okay, so this would be two a little bit larger examples uh, what our tool can do. And so I'm approaching the end of my talk, uh, and so I want to summarize now what uh, we have shown you today. So it was mainly about this bug finding technique found in model checking and our tool uh, for this technique, which is LLBMC. So if you've seen that uh, LLBMC can verify C programs. I would say up to several thousand lines of code, so because this was uh, relatively arithmetic and hard code to verify, and in other cases I think we should get able to scale up to a bit more, so I would say several thousand lines of code are possible with this tool. Uh, and it's especially suited for low-level system code, where this method has already shown that it works uh, quite well. In, for example, in those uh, case studies which were done with this general method of bounding model checking of software and not with our tool. And uh, so this is some work that we have done in the past and that was for example on device drivers in the Linux kernel where we have found some error with this technique. Also equivalence checking of cryptographic routines, so we compare to AES implementations. And we also were using this technique uh, in embedded systems automotive domain to functional verify certain um, devices on a car. Okay, so this is the state now, and if we look into the future, what is still missing, or what would we like to do in the future? Uh, something which is missing from this uh, supporting all of C and all of C++ is still floating point arithmetic, uh, which is conceptually not that hard to implement, but it's, uh, it takes some time. The other thing is support for more complex or complicated languages than C, like C++, or so perhaps even Objective C. What is also something that has to be done in the future is to provide some specifications for wide, widely used library functions. For example, for libc, read functions from a file, write functions to a file. That's something which we have not yet covered with our tool, which we have to do in the future. And of course, performance improvements are always good to have. So that's uh, what we are, we are planning to work on in the future. But I think this, that this technique is already quite, quite usable for uh, many programs, especially if you're using these techniques like uh, generalizing a test case, for example, and the test case is typically do not encompass the whole program that you want to verify, but just a small fraction of it. And there it might be sufficient. Okay, so this 
concludes my talk, our talk, uh, and if you want to get further information, you can either get it from our research group's website here, very alt, it's called for verification with language matching, or directly from the site website for our tool, and we are planning to make this tool available uh, in April this year, so in April you could start looking at the web page and download a version of it and start playing with it together. Thank you. So I guess I have to ask the main question that I always ask in talks about model shaping, which is what do you do about higher order programs, like as soon as you get function pointers or okay. pointers yeah. or objects? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we can handle uh, function pointers uh, with our tool, but the, the techniques to handle them um, are mainly also to, to inline all possible functions that uh, could occur at a certain place. So if you have a, a function pointer, uh, you can try to find out a, a candidate set of possible functions that might be called at that place. So you basically so defunctionalize the program and then do the first order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's mainly what we do. And then you can just try to make it a uh, bit more scalable. First how, thing does, how does that work together with your parameterized unit tests? So you cannot parameterize over functions, I suppose, like pointers. Yeah, I think in principle it should work. So you do not have to fix it to one function in your, in your programs. And you, mainly what you're doing is you just uh, make a big switch statement in your program, which just switches between the, uh, different functions. But, right, but then it might be hard to specify which. Right, you need to the particular need, function. You need to know the whole program at that point, right? Yeah, that's Which right. It means you can't really do unit testing or unit checking anymore. Or in our, per, I'm, I'm not sure what this is saying, but I would say you need the whole source code. So you, you cannot assume, for example, that uh, your function points to something externally. Uh, but if I'm talking about, if I want to check a library, then mm -hmm. it's not defined what the whole source code is, right? So, for example, yeah. the matter that finds a fixed point of a function, mm -hmm. it takes function as a parameter. Yeah. And there is no reasonable range for these functions. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an artificial yeah, example, really. But yeah. But, but, but perhaps it's, at least it, yeah, it's, it's an example uh, which, which shows perhaps uh, the point here. But yeah, if you do not know anything about a function, then you cannot uh, handle with this method. Yes. But it's the same with unbounded data structures, really, right? So if you pass in a tree parameter into some mm -hmm. function mm -hmm. and it computes something on that, then you can't just check all trees that are possible. Yes, yeah. That, that's also the case. And uh, But I would say uh, what is perhaps important here is that you can check all, uh, or you're, you're bounding your program traces. And this also means typically that you bound your data structures. So this means you, for example, check all trees up to a size of uh, 100 nodes or 1,000 nodes or something like that. And then, then you can say something about this. And uh, for many errors, it, uh, they, they also or they already show up for a limited, a smaller example. So or that's that's the, the idea behind this technique. Why why it is expected to work? But it also shows some smaller examples. Yes. Um, so in theory, obviously, you don't have false positives. Mm -hmm. um, but in practice, probably you do because there is a lot of code that just doesn't care about some cases where you have a you write a unit test and you pull out a helper function that have two it has two in parameters and you divide and you just know that in you, in your code you don't call it right. Mm -hmm. um, have you run it over like arbitrary examples and like looked at how high your false positive rate is? No, as uh, as I said, so this is relatively new this tool, so we haven't made really extensive <coughs> testing. But uh, what you can say about uh, false positives here is that uh, so if you have everything together, if you have the, the whole source code, and if those uh, bounds are sufficient, then this method uh, is, is complete and will not uh, show any false positives, as long as there are no programming errors in there, at least in our tool. Uh, but for larger examples, this is often not the case. So typically, you have library calls, for example. And for these library calls, uh, you do not want to include the whole source code of, the, of those calls. And then you will just give a specification or some approximation of what this function does. And as soon as you're using those approximations, you also can get uh, some false error reports. But I would say that the, the method in general uh, is 
complete and doesn't uh, provide such, uh, error, uh, such false errors, but uh, in practical cases, as soon as you have to use the library functions, then uh, such things can happen. But we hope that it's still better than with other techniques like abstract interpretation, for example, which are making even coarser uh, approximations than this. Yeah, that would be the interesting thing because most like uh, things I've seen that uh, find bugs actually have the problem of too many false positives mm -hmm. where in the end it's just too much time to drill through all those examples to actually find the real bugs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I would say that this uh, that this is an advantage of, of this bounded model checking method that it should be better than, for example, these um, abstract interpretation tools uh, which are mainly computing ranges for variables. Uh, and, so, and, and with using these bit precise techniques, you can really often avoid uh, this kind of two cause approximation in, uh, in checking. Yeah, but I, I also know of those study studies which compare different verification tools and also uh, all these abstract interpretation tools and uh, the, the rates can be really quite high for those tools, but we have to make a, perhaps a more sophisticated study and see how it turns out in practice. And in, in that case is that we have, uh, that I've shown you on the last slide, for example, Linux kernel of this automotive software, it uh, didn't turn out to be such a big problem. So uh, what, what I could also mention, we also made uh, together with, with Bosch, uh, one um, kind of research project where we tried to combine abstract interpretation that was a commercial tool that they were already using at, at Bosch, which is called Polyspace, uh, and which, is, which produces quite some number of uh, such false error reports, and we tried to combine it with our method. Uh, and we did it in such a way that we first run this less precise um, abstract interpretation method, and then, out of those possible errors that is too reported, we just checked them again with our tool, and we could get rid of, uh, I think, more than 70% of the, those errors that were reported by the initial tool. So that would perhaps also be a possibility. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. so you, uh, you said you spent about a week getting the, the basic C++ uh, support in there. Yeah. So how much time do you think would it take to support all, or let's say most of C++. Yeah, it's so mm, oh, always hard to guess how long this rough project will take years, years decades. I think, in, uh, not decades, I hope, but <laughs> I, I think in a, in a year or so you could uh, really do quite a bit on that. So what is what is still missing, or perhaps uh, you can say more about is what, what are the main points that, we, what, that what have to be done? Once again, running in general would be probably quite quickly because uh, on the LLVM level there's not that much of a difference between C++ and C code because it's all just abstract assembler. What, what was the first larger change that we had to do is to support function pointers. And what we do right now is inline, inline all possible function pointers that would fit, for example. And um, we over approximate and we inline lots more functions than would actually be necessary. So what we have to do in that case is to go back and look which functions could it actually be. And that would most of the time be the ones of the uh, derived classes, for example, that would actually uh, be um, overloaded functions of the same base function. And we don't do that right now. We just take all functions that match, uh, have a matching signature. So to get that information, which is completely lost on the LLVM level, we'd have to spend some more work on it, but it's not like this is a theoretical problem, it's more an engineering problem, we just have to do it, implement it. But doesn't you all, isn't there also a theoretical problem in the sense that your search space explodes quickly when you have an object on the program because of it, all the functions you might call it? it that's especially a problem because we take in all the functions that are roughly matched, right. that's a lot more, that's the other approximation that makes it inefficient. It, it's, it runs, you can use it, but uh, it won't be as efficient to get it efficient and to reduce that over approximation to really the, uh, exactly those functions that can actually be called in that particular context. Uh, to reduce it to that number would be a little bit of work. So you can, I suppose you can restrict it by looking at the type of a function, you can restrict it by looking at which class it is defined. You can, you can for example, just um, see what happens if, um, if that particular function is called. You set an assertion at that location where it is called. And instead of calling the function, you say, oh, 
Now, this is uh, stop it here and tell us what was the, f the value of the function pointer at, th at this particular place. And then you can look it up which function was that value and you can take uh, note it and, and add it to the list of functions that could be called at this particular point. And you can cache that information for later on. So you can say, for example, if it's this, at this uh, function in this line, uh, I'm calling one of these of this set of functions. So you could do things like that to reduce the number of possible functions that can be called. But you're still, but getting yeah. back to my earlier point, you're still bound to your whole program approach, right? You yeah. can't get around that really. Um, so. You would have to generate all possible uh, function definitions that you can pass in. Function so, definition. like checking an object-oriented library in that way is... Well, well, perhaps that's not the, the, the intention of this, so you would really have to write some program which uses the library and to really test the whole program then right. um, like and doing this, this library check, I think that's, uh, yeah. that's really hard. What, what you would do in a unit test, you would actually create the, map, uh, the, the object and initialize its vtable and, and all that stuff, and instead of uh, having one specific object at that location, you could say, okay, this could be one of these objects, or this object, or this, or this class, or this class, and you get some kind of non-determinism at that point, but you're still restricted to a subset. So it's like a unit test, but a little bit more general, and that reduces the complexity mm. in, uh, in, in total. But if you just say it's some object and I don't know anything about it, then, well, yeah, most likely uh, it will be too uh, hard to, to so uh, solve that. So maybe solution, maybe provide some method of um, putting metadata on uh, function declarations that tell your tool the necessary information of the implementations that you could plug into that, like giving variants of that that might help. They need to do the verification part of the outer code that calls a function. It's, uh, I think there's, uh, either you add this kind of annotation to the function itself and say, okay, this function is always called with the correct object of this or this or this type, or you um, simply create that object. So you have uh, some kind of test driver function that calls the function you want to check, and that builds up, let's say, for example, you have um, some kind of tree data structure with different kinds of, of classes in that tree. You build up a small tree that fits the kind of tree that you want to check. And then, um, but you don't do it explicitly like um, object number, uh, node number five is um, of this class, but you say node number five is of, of one of these classes. And you create a non-deterministic one like that. And then you pass that non-deterministic tree into the function and you know that uh, it will be later restricted to this kind of, uh, to these kind of trees. So it would be some kind of, I think that's the best approach you can do with this. Take a unit test, and make it more general and more general until you hit that kind of performance uh, um, bound, until you can't make it more uh, general without making, in, making it inefficient. And I think that's the best way to go, to start off with a, something very specific and to make it more general as far as possible. And you will cover lots more different cases with that. So. Are you looking into running your tool on your tool source code? <laughs> I know that's what most people do that work in compilers. <laughs> so, uh, I think we're still, yeah. still quite a bit of uh, from that for uh, yeah, no, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps actually. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure we could get it running for the more basic uh, data types that we use quite quickly, actually. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't take more than, let's say, another one or two weeks just to get used to it and how to do it. But I, you you, yeah. you could announce it as it definitely finds these errors. We have checked that. Yeah. <laughs> the, the problem is we use C plus plus and we only added C plus plus for the last week. So <laughs> before that was completely. No, but it, it, it still, still finds all the known errors. That is true. Mm, sure. So what about Zilla? <coughs> about this. Uh, yeah. Can you use Zilla? Right. It's you know, limited complexity, relative basic data types. Can you validate that? Okay, so you're not talking about this, uh, about this compression library, or yes? Or, ah, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we were looking at some uh, parts of that uh, of this unit that was, uh, for example, the checksum computation. Um, but um, so it was, and that, that was mainly because of library functions uh, mm -hmm. that were called in, in the whole program, which we not yet support. 
but uh, these um, checksum computations, for example, that's something that we can check. Uh, so we, we also have some tests which we can show you later. So. Thank you.